May we've come for a lot of different reasons this morning, but above all else, we have come to lift up the name of, of Christ. Really glad you're here today. Good morning and welcome. I want to say a word to those of you who may have worshipped online at some point this summer, uh, whether you're online this morning or here in the room. I heard from people who worshipped online live stream from their camper in the woods this summer and people who worshipped online from their boat on the lake. And one guy uh, was water skiing while simultaneously live streaming. The, no, he wasn't doing that. I mean, <laughs> didn't go that far. But I am really grateful for the technology that keeps us connected even when we can't all be together. Now, not all of you live stream when you're away, and that's okay too. Hopefully, you've had time this summer to be with family and friends. That is critically important. Uh, maybe you got to spend time outdoors in the beauty of God's creation, and there is no better sanctuary of worship than God's creation, all that gives him glory. But here in the final leg of summer, I feel like it's time to call the church together. Uh, our church and most churches are a bit scattered in the summer months. Our church, most churches, were scattered for two years during a pandemic. And today we're going to see the Apostle Paul in our study of the book of Ephesians get to a place in the letter where he talks directly to church people and he says, you have a calling. You have an individual calling and you have a corporate calling as a church. You have an individual calling. Every human being does. You've been given by God gifts and passions and purposes. And then collectively a church has a corporate calling as a body of Jesus. And Paul says your callings are critically important to the world. This is the words of the Apostle Paul to church people in the first century and in ours. Today's scripture reading uh, comes from the book of Ephesians and it'll be read by one of our elders, Gene Richards, is a newly affirmed elder and uh, rejoining the session. Uh, would you stand as Gene reads for us the scripture reading of the day? Let's turn our hearts and minds to God's word. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 to 14. As a prisoner of the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. That's why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean? except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions. He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the universe. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God, would you open this uh, word now to our, to our hearing, to our understanding, to our use, and for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, you have just heard read part of a first century letter. Uh, 
The letter was written by a guy named Paul. We refer to him often as the Apostle Paul. He wrote the letter from prison to church people in the city of Ephesus. Now we have good reason to believe that Paul's intent was for this letter to be read not only in Ephesus, but to be circulated among churches throughout that region. The letter to the Ephesians breaks down cleanly into two halves. The first half, chapters 1 through 3, is the theological foundation. And there's some rich theology about the nature of salvation and the nature of the church. The second half, chapters 4 through 6, is now the implications, the practical living out of the theology that was established in the first half. Because you don't want to get the theology down but then miss the working out of it in your life. So the book of Ephesians is a good mix of deep theology and practical living. And it is for this reason that the, the famous Protestant reformer John Calvin called the letter to the Ephesians his favorite letter in all the New Testament. And a lot of people have said something similar. And so today we start the second half of the letter. We've been working through this letter all summer long and today we turn to the second half, the practical life application part of the letter to the Ephesians. And you heard it begin this way, chapter 4, as a prisoner for the Lord. That's not a metaphor. He's writing this from prison. Then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. You have a calling given by God, an individual calling and a corporate calling. Paul says, we discussed all that in the theology section of the letter. Now live it out. And as you live out your calling and your callings, remember to stay unified. Unity is the key theme in this section of the letter. The Apostle Paul urges them on this. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit. Keep the unity. Now uh, Paul was writing to a very diverse church. Ephesus was a city that was a harbor city, a port city, a place of international trade. And so people came from all over the world to and through Ephesus. Now oftentimes the people that visited or moved there became Christians through the witness of this church at Ephesus. And they found their way into the church. And so now the church is made up of people of all different kinds of backgrounds now who are getting along as one church. I was thinking about this in our country. We have one of the mottos of the United States. It's printed on the back of every dollar bill. On the back of the dollar bill, there's the emblem of the eagle. Can everybody see this okay? And the eagle has in his mouth this, this banner and, uh, and it's very, very small and the banner says, some of you have remarkable eyes because that is, uh, I can't even, it says e pluribus unum, Latin phrase e pluribus unum which means from the many one. And it's a great model for the United States of America, from the many nations, one nation, from many peoples, one people. And that's kind of what the Apostle Paul is saying to this church at Ephesus. You know, your church comes from all different kinds of backgrounds, ethnically, religiously, geographically, but now in Jesus you are one. E pluribus unum. Now we all know a lot of churches that have plenty of pluribus and not much unum to them. And that's not what Paul wants. And so Paul hammers this home. Look what he says in the next line. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. And the key word is one. One faith, one Lord, one baptism, one church. God has made us one. Uh, Paul's going to hit this again and again. Now notice a slight difference in wording between verse 2 and verse 13. You see this most clearly in the King James English translation. One place Paul says maintain the unity. Another place he says attain to the unity. And this has led to an interesting debate among the commentators. Uh, is unity something we already ha have achieved? Is unity something already that's ours and we have to maintain it? 
Or is it a goal to be attained? Is, is Christian unity a reality, a reality to be maintained? Or is it a goal to be attained? Do we already have it? Or do we long for it? And the answer is yes. It, there is a very real sense in which Christian unity has already been accomplished in Jesus Christ. We are already made one and there's another sense that this is still to be achieved. So let's look back at that theological first half of Paul's letter. The foundations, we'll move back to, to chapter 2 here for a minute. This is what Paul wrote that we covered this earlier in the summer. For he himself is our peace who has made the two groups, the Jews and the non-Jews, he's made the two groups one and has destroyed the dividing wall of hostility. What a great phrase, the dividing wall of hostility. His purpose, God's purpose was to create in himself one humanity, one humanity out of the two, thus making peace. And in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross. God has made us one. For those who are in Christ, the death and resurrection of Jesus made you one with God and one with the rest of God's children. It's already happened. It is not a goal to be strived for. It is a reality to be embraced. We are one. Paul says this is the theological reality. You are one. We're already unified. Now live it out. Now maintain it. Now attain to the fullness of it. And it's going to take peace and patience and humility and all the things Paul talks about here. Uh, but it is worth it because a unified church is a powerful church. Let's move on. Paul says in uh, the next line, He who descended, this is Jesus, Jesus who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe so Christ himself gave, and we'll stop there for a minute. This is a very important line. Jesus descended at the incarnation. Jesus left all the splendors of heaven and voluntarily descended, condescended, and became a human being with all the frailties of humanity. Then after the death and resurrection, Jesus ascended to, he says, to, to, to higher than all the heavens... He descended and then ascended in order to fill the whole universe. Jesus did not ascend to the highest heavens to escape earth, but to fill it. He did not ascend to get away from all those crazies on planet earth, but to inhabit every part of the universe and bring everything under his rule. He's going to inhabit every part of the universe and everything comes under him as king. So what's he going to do to achieve that? So he wants that to happen. So Christ himself gave and what do you think the next line is going to be? Christ wants to inhabit the whole universe. He wants to bring everything under his reign. So Christ himself gave the, the, the Holy Spirit, maybe. He gave a, a boatload of money to create institutions. He gave uh, superpowers. What, what's Christ going to give so he can inhabit the whole universe and bring everything under his reign? Let's see. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Okay, well, there's a lot in that paragraph. But notice God himself gave people. Certain people. He, he didn't give spirits. He didn't, he didn't give superpowers. He gave ordinary people who had individual callings, individual gifts, so that the whole church would be built up. And then eventually, the loving reign of God would fill the whole universe. Now, Paul names five specific roles or offices, and I want to look at them in turn. 
the first one he specifically names is apostles. Now that word apostle literally means sent ones. Now in the strictest sense that word apostle is reserved for the men who were called by Jesus when they were physically present with Jesus. In a broader sense an apostle can be anyone who is sent by God for a new work. Uh, apostles love to do new things. Today we would call an apostle an entrepreneur or maybe a pioneer. Uh, people with apostolic gifts and some of you have these gifts. Uh, apostles are often thinking about the future. They love thinking about the future, bridging barriers, um, developing leaders, networking. People with apostolic gifts focus on new ideas. They love the new and expanding ministry to new locations in new contexts. Anybody here, by a show of hands, anybody here think they might have some apostle-like gifts in them? Or if you're online, just write me. Anyone think they got that entrepreneur, uh, new person uh, launch? Uh, more of you have this gift than you think do. Every church, every team needs some apostles as part of that church, as part of that team. The second one is prophets. Prophets speak on behalf of God. Uh, prophets don't just tell the future. They speak God's word to people. Some people think that because we now have the Bible, prophets are no longer needed. Because we know God's word. It's in print for us. But there are people who are gifted by God to be especially attuned to God and to God's wisdom and God's truth. We have people with prophetic gifts in our congregation. Uh, if you have this gift, you're someone who challenges the dominant assumptions inherited by our culture. Prophets challenge the status quo. They bring correction. And every team, every church needs some apostles on it. Anybody here think you might have some uh, prophetic inklings? Uh, you're a truth teller, a, a truth speaker online. Just write me. Okay, so more of you have this than you think do. The next one he calls out is evangelists. Evangelists share good news. The root word of that word evangel means good news. And today's evangelists are often winsome recruiters. They recruit people to Jesus. They recruit people to the mission of Jesus. They call for personal uh, commitment. Anybody here have the wiring of an evangelist? We need evangelists. Every church, every team needs some evangelists. And then we get to the shepherds. Uh, in the Bible, shepherds and pastors, same word. Translated two different ways. Shepherds are the caregivers of the flock. They tend for the flock. They take care of people. They're nurturers. Uh, they're disciplers. Uh, anybody here have shepherd instincts? That caregiving mercy instincts, I would expect that to be number one in our church. I see the most hands just visibly here for that one. We have a lot of shepherds. And last one he calls out as teachers. And teachers, of course, um, understand and explain God's word. They make sure that group, that team stays biblically grounded. Now, uh, you really need all five roles. Each role, each gift contributes something unique to that church or to that team. This is really important. Let's look at it again. Apostles extend the gospel. You need that. Prophets know God's will. Evangelists recruit to Jesus and to the mission of Jesus. Shepherds nurture and protect. Teachers understand and explain. And you need all five contributions in any good, healthy, balanced church or team. Uh, you wouldn't want uh, the whole group to be apostles because we'd all be tired and worn out from starting new things. We need shepherds and teachers to give some stability and grounding. You wouldn't want everyone to be evangelists. Evangelists, frankly, they're, they're always more interested in outsiders than in insiders. Teachers left all by themselves without the other gifts. Teachers might be prone to go off on theological tangents and doctrinal nuances and it takes a prophet to call people to action. So we need all of these gifts. Some people refer to this as the five-fold ministry outlined in Ephesians 4 or apest, the first letter of each, apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers, apest. But in the last 100 years, some would say the last 500 years, the church has elevated two of the five and the church has ignored three of the five. There's two that the American church in particular really elevates and leans in and three that we almost virtually ignore. Anyone know what I'm talking about? Which ones are elevated? 
you people that have been a part of church for a while? Shepherds and teachers? Shepherds and teachers. Seminaries train shepherds and teachers. Churches hire shepherds and teachers. We, we emphasize shepherd and teaching and we virtually ignore the other ones. Now what's, what's wrong with that? What's the problem with that? And as someone who's wired more as a shepherd and teacher, and as someone who's full-time employed by this church, I'd rather not say more right now <laughs> for job security. Uh, this is not about jobs or employment. This is about a church using the gifts of everybody. And if we're, if we're supposed to be the apest, fivefold, we've emphasized the S and T. It's left a lot of people wondering, where are the apes? Where are the apostles? Where are the prophets? Where are the evangelists? Uh, we need those gifts activated in our church. Now we know there are more than five gifts. Paul only mentions five. Elsewhere in his writings, Paul lists dozens of spiritual gifts. So why only five here? Maybe these are just examples. Uh, you know, none of Paul's gift lists are exhaustive. They are illustrative. Maybe this is the first five he thought of top of mind. Or maybe Paul the church planter starts with these five gifts. Starts with these five roles. When you're building a jigsaw puzzle, uh, you know, you take those, that box and you, you, you dump it out on the table. Maybe it's a 100 piece puzzle. Some of you do 500 piece puzzles. Uh, maybe it's a thousand piece puzzle, though that sounds like a nightmare to me personally. And you put it all on the table and you turn all the pieces to the, the, the pictures up front. But you don't start with just any piece, do you? You're looking for certain pieces to start. What are you looking for? You're looking for the corners, looking for the flat edges and you build the outside and then once you have a little bit of a frame you can start to fill the inside. Maybe the church planter, the Apostle Paul was saying when you're starting a new church and you know we're starting a new campus of Ward Church in Farmington Hills this fall, relaunching a work there and there better be part of that team, there better be some apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds and teachers in that Farmington Hills team. And then once you have those established, you can fill in with all the other gifts of God. The gift of administration, gift of hospitality, gift of helps. And once you have that in place, these are in place so that the whole church can be built up. That is what our verse said. Let's look at the key verse of the day again from Ephesians 4. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. Why? To equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. Their job is to equip all God's people for works of service, so that the whole church can be built up, and so that Jesus can inhabit the whole universe. I want to introduce you to some people in our church who are using their gifts as part of the church. Um, let me invite uh, Johan and Adelina Friesen to the platform, and Phil and Rachel Norton, would you come up and join me uh, here again? These two couples are active serving the church and I've asked them just to tell you a little bit about uh, where you're serving, uh, where you're serving, um, why you're serving, and what, what is serving meant to you. And we'll start over here, Rachel. Guess where I'm serving. Uh <laughs> So I've, I've always been a part of the music ministry here at Ward. It was very um, apparent to me early on that that was the calling for me and my capacity in which to serve. Um, I was in the choir for many years before I switched over to this service, and I love all forms of music. But the most important thing for me is that I've always connected to Christ through music, through worship songs, and it's always elevated my worship. And um, I serve because it's my hope that I can be a part of helping to elevate um, everybody else's worship through music as well. Um, no matter what you prefer, traditional or modern, the important thing is that you're connecting to God, and that's my hope in serving in the music ministry. Yeah, thank you. My name is Phil Norton. Um, as you can see, I work with Word Kids, um, one of the many leaders here who work with our children. Um, I was actually called to the service. I would not have chosen it. Um, anybody who knows me would have known that that would have been the furthest thing that I would have thought I would have gone to, uh, especially with lack of patience. But he works miracles, right? He works through every one of us, and we're here to plant seeds. And so when I finally recognized the calling after much poking in the ribs and smacking in the back of the head from our father, um, I came to realize that that was exactly where I belong. And he works through me, and that is probably the most patient I ever am is when I'm in that room. 
Um, but I've gotten to see those seeds. We didn't just plant them, I've actually got to see them be grown. And that is the reward in serving. It's not work. If you find your skill and your spiritual gift that works for you, it just is what you're doing and you enjoy it. And I very much enjoy it. Um, I couldn't ask for a better place to be for me in this church. So. You didn't see it for yourself, but a lot of people didn't. saw you in this role and you're having yeah. a ball. Yeah, multiple. You, uh, this is the highest compliment. You really connect to first graders. Thanks. Yeah, that's a, yeah, same thing. Yeah. <laughs> Like-minded people. Yeah. They, 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 they love you. I've seen, I've seen you in action, and it's a great place for you. Um, how about you, Johan? Uh, so we... Is what? We work in... Is the button up? Yep. Yeah, it's up. We work in a, a mental health support group, and... Try it again. <laughs> we work in a mental health support group, and why do I do this work? Because my wife asked me to. <laughs> yeah, so I, I did the... The gift uh, of wisdom. Yeah, I have the <laughs> skills for production. So I was helping out with the computer and setting up everything. And uh, I, I didn't start with it, right? She wanted to try it herself, but I got pulled into this. But the reason I actually serve, and uh, I also served a lot in Germany, is because I think God gave us his love, and the only way we can experience his love is if we share it with other people. If we start serving, if we are with other people, only then love is visible and, and we can experience it. And I like it that Jesus said is that this is how other people will recognize that you are my disciples, as you are my peoples, when you have love with each other. So I encourage serving, being together, sharing the love of Christ. Thank you. Um, yes, my name is Adelina. I am in charge of the mental health support group here at Ward. And um, so I grew up in church and I was served all my life through the people in my church. And I became a Christian in my church and I met Johan while volunteering. So one of the benefits of volunteering is you could find your spouse. You can. That's I highly recommend. <laughs> so um, serving others was and still is a natural reaction for the both of us. Um, because we want to be a blessing for the people around us. And I want to be Jesus for the people around me. So that's my personal um, motivation. Um, but we also wanted to serve in an area which comes natural to us. So Johan is a trained engineer and I'm trained in theology and counseling. And I really don't do computers. So I tried to organize the group and failed miserable with the computer. So I gave him a call and he stood up and picked up the responsibilities. And I'm, the things we do come so easy to us. So it's not really a big effort for me to care and to make people feel welcomed and loved. And he gets the tech running, and that just is for us serving is not something magical. It's actually just doing what you're best at. And it's such a minimal effort for us and such a big, big blessing for others. And that's why we enjoy and love doing it. Well, thank you. Thank you all for sharing your story. Thank you so much. Yeah, Paul said uh, the, the idea is that the, the whole church should be built up and equipped for works of service. That was his phrase, works of service. And works of service includes volunteer roles inside the church, volunteer roles outside the church, but this also includes works of service to your neighbors and to your co-workers. This includes less formal uh, volunteer roles. Uh, uh, works of service includes and honors your individual callings. So a healthy church equips you, a healthy, balanced church equips you for your ministry inside the church and inside the world. Lastly, I want to point out that Jesus perfectly fills all five offices. Jesus perfectly fills all five offices. Was Jesus a, an apostle? Yes, he was the supreme sent one. 
sent by God for a brand new work uh, uh, among humanity. Uh, was he a prophet? Did he speak on behalf of God? Did he speak the word of God? Absolutely. Not only did he speak God's word, he was the word of God. Was he an evangelist? Did he bring good news? Yeah, he said he had come to bring good news. More than that, he was the good news. Was he a shepherd? Yeah, he was the good shepherd. And a good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. Was he a teacher? He was the most brilliant teacher ever to walk this planet. Jesus perfectly fulfills all five of these offices and now we, the church, are his body and those offices are now present, those gifts are now present within the body of Jesus. The way they were ultimately fulfilled in Jesus, they are now among his body and we want all of the gifts that God gave to be released so that we uh, can see the whole church be built up and that Jesus will fill the whole universe. We're going to pray to that end and then we're going to share in the sacrament of Holy Communion and then if you'd like to pray with somebody, have somebody pray for and with you at the conclusion of today's service, we have some elders and prayer team members who are going to be right in front of this room in front of the sanctuary and if you'd like someone to pray specifically with you, for you, for any need, uh, you just come on front after the service and they would be really happy uh, to pray for you. Let's pray, uh, let's pray together now. Well, God, thank you for this letter from the Apostle Paul instructing a church how to be a church. Thank you for this letter's rich theology and practical instruction. This letter is a treasure to your church today. Help us each to live a life worthy of the calling we have received. We have a common calling to be your children, an individual calling to make our unique contribution in this world, and a corporate calling to be your church on mission. May the giftedness of your people be unleashed for your purpose and for your glory. Father, we affirm and give thanks today that there is one body and one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. As we turn now to the Lord's Supper, remind us of this unity that is already ours through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Come Lord Jesus and fill this whole universe. And everyone agreed together and said, Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me as we prepare for communion?